It is an honor to be able to be here and uh, speak to you this morning. Uh, anytime that you get an invitation to be at the School of Preaching, you uh, feel like you're privileged, and it's uh, just a wonderful occasion to be here. Um, Brother Moser said that uh, uh, I would have to suffer through his um, uh, introducing me. Uh, any uh, of the faculty that's here who introduces you, uh, it is a privilege to be introduced by any one of those individuals. They made mention of Brother Robert Taylor. When I was uh, growing up in Memphis, there were two lectureships. There was the Memphis School of Preaching lectureship and the Spiritual Sword lectureship. And uh, I got to attend both of those. And some of the great men of the past were preaching, and Brother Taylor was one of those individuals. And he was such an influence on me that when my son was born, we named him Michael Taylor Eskew. So uh, I appreciated Brother Taylor, love Brother Taylor, and he's going to be a man who is definitely missed uh, for a long period of time. Fortunately, we have many of his books, uh, many of his lessons that are taped, and we can benefit uh, from those. We're grateful that you're here this morning. When I get invited to a lectureship, I understand how important it is, and I understand the responsibility. It was the Apostle Paul who said, preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. The Bible also teaches us in Ephesians 4, 15, that we need to preach the truth in love. However, the preacher is also supposed to preach with authority, according to Titus 2, verse 15. We are also owed to be individuals who preach with boldness, Ephesians 6, verses 19 and 20. We need to be individuals who are not fearful to stand for the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. In our society today, we need to be lights. We need congregations to be lights. We need men of God to be lights. We need Christians to be lights because we are in the midst of darkness today. The title of our lesson this morning is Wise Fools. I am glad that we have figurative language in our language, aren't you? Figurative language enables us to be creative. It enables us to be better teachers. If it were not for figurative language, many of our sermons, many of our classes, many of our articles would be even duller than maybe some of the brethren already think they are. Wise fools. My friends, that is known as an oxymoron. It involves the bringing together of two conflicting, contradictory ideas. Wise fools. If you are wise, you are not a fool. If you are a fool, you are not wise. And yet, in our lesson today, we have the two brought together, wise fools. That's like saying something like a big little man. I've said that oftentimes to my grandson. You're just a big little man. See, those are two conflicting uh, ideas, are they not? And yet we put them together. And that's what we're going to be studying. The point is this. Individuals who are wise fools are wise in their own eyes. If you were to ask them, are you a wise individual? That individual would say, oh yes, I am wise. I've been trained. I've been educated. I know what I'm talking about. I am a wise man. And yet... In the eyes of God, that individual is a fool. So the title, Wise Fools. There have been wise fools in the past, and there are wise fools who still exist in our society today. And in this lesson, we're going to be looking at Bible examples of wise fools, and also we're going to be looking at examples today of wise fools. We have four points that we're going to be examining in this lesson. The first is this. A conceited man is a wise fool. The Bible talks about these conceited wise fools in Proverbs 28, verse 12. Seest thou a man who is wise in his own conceits? There is more hope of a fool than of him. What does it mean to be conceited? That little word conceit simply means this. An individual who has an excessive opinion of himself. In fact, is an excessive positive opinion of himself. 
He believes himself to be something greater, mightier, more beautiful, more popular, more powerful than he really, truly is. I believe this concept of conceit goes all the way back to the evil one himself. We turned into the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. Beginning at verse 12, we have a prophecy about a king. In that particular chapter, he's specifically talking about the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. We turn to Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, and we read of another prophecy concerning another king, an individual known as the king of Tyre. And there are some beautiful descriptions, very interesting descriptions of these particular individuals. And as you begin to read through those descriptions, you say, wow, these descriptions are so lofty. These descriptions are so high that they can't just be talking about these particular kings. I believe that the Holy Spirit had reference to another event in the long ago in his mind. And that was the fall of Satan. He looked at the fall of Satan long, long ago, and now he looks at the king of Babylon, he looks at the king of Tyre, and he says, these two men are almost identical to Satan, and the same thing that happened to them is going to happen to these two kings. Go back and read the text. I will ascend into heaven, perfect in thy ways, a cherub, An individual who is going to be cast down to hell. An individual who is going to be cast down to the ground. Those are some powerful statements, are they not? Statements that, yes, could even be applied to Satan himself. Listen to Isaiah chapter 12, beginning of verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will be exalted above the height of the clouds. Listen to this last statement. I will be like the Most High. Unbelievable, is it not? That mankind could have those kind of thoughts in their mind? Individuals who have excessive opinions of themselves? I am as lofty, I am as great, I am as powerful as the majesty on high. That, my friends, is a conceited individual. Do we have conceited individuals in our society today? Absolutely. It's unbelievable, is it not? Individuals who are leaders of nations are conceited. Individuals who are leaders in their sports field have become conceited individuals. Turn on the television and watch a few shows and you see some media individuals who are quite conceited, don't you? Businessmen in our society who are just as conceited as they possibly can be. And yes, even among those who are religious and who are leaders in religion can be conceited. Now there is absolutely no doubt that these individuals oftentimes are leaders in their field, aren't they? These are individuals who have studied their craft and they have come to a great knowledge of what they do. And what they do, they do well. These individuals have amassed awards. These individuals are individuals who have broken records. And yes, when we see them in their field, we love them and we enjoy them and we appreciate them. But over the course of time, They begin to develop the idea that I'm a little bit better, I'm a little bit greater than other individuals are. 
They start developing this high opinion, this lofty opinion of themselves, don't they? And not only are they wise, not only are they smart when it comes to their field, somehow, miraculously, they all of a sudden are knowledgeable in all other areas. And it is their job and it is their responsibility to speak on those areas. And individuals, because of who they are, need to listen to what they have to say. They flaunt all over one another. It's almost sickening, is it not? My friends, if you do not hear them, if you do not respect their opinion on all other matters, then these individuals will disdain you, you will become their enemy, and oftentimes they will do anything they possibly can in order to destroy you. Because they are wise in their own conceits. These individuals need to go back and they need to study some Bible history, do they not? My friends, what happened? to Satan when he lifted himself up against God. The Bible tells us, does he not? That he and his angels were cast down to hell. 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. That Babylonian king was told this, I will cast thee down to hell. Isaiah 14 verse 15. The king of Tyrus was told these words, I will cast thee down to the ground. Thou shalt lay before kings. And they shall behold thee. Ezekiel 28 verse 17. Do you remember a man by the name of Herod? In Acts the 12th chapter. He steps out early in the morning in all of his kingly garb. Glowing before the crowd. Makes a great oratory speech. And the crowd yells out. It is not the voice of a man. It is the voice of God. And he was eaten with worms was he not? The Jewish nation lifted themselves up. We are the children of Abraham. We are the people of God. We are the covenant people. And what did God do? In AD 70, the Roman armies of Titus marched against that city and brought that city to its knees. And the temple was laid waste, not one stone upon another, according to the precious words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My friends, our God will bring the conceited down to the ground. They are only wise in their own eyes. Point number two, the rich can sometimes be wise fools, can't they? There is absolutely nothing wrong with being rich. Nothing wrong with that in and of itself. We go into the Bible and we find many rich individuals, don't we? One of them was a man by the name of Abraham. It would have been interesting to have gone back and to have done some inventory of everything Abraham had and how much he was really worth in that particular day. He would have been extremely wealthy, but he was a man of faith. He was a man of God, and he walked with God, didn't he? There's nothing in and of itself wrong with being rich, but there are some grave temptations that come with riches. And there are many individuals who become rich and wealthy who are just not able to handle the wealth and the treasure that God bestows upon those individuals. Question. Is a rich man wise? I would say yes. As far as many of them are concerned, here are individuals who know how to go out and they learn how to amass a major fortune, do they not? Millions of dollars. Not millions of dollars, billions of dollars. These individuals are able to build empires. They're able to build businesses that benefit society. They are able to employ hundreds, if not thousands of individuals. They know about banking. They know about investments. They know about the tax code. These are individuals who know how to negotiate great deals. They know how to network themselves among the rich and the powerful individuals of our world. And if they lost everything today, many of them within months or years could build their empire back 
and once again, they could be millionaires. I don't know about you, it takes wisdom to be able to do those things. But sometimes the rich are wise fools, aren't they? You see, they begin to trust in themselves rather than in the living God. They begin to trust in their riches rather than in the God of heaven. They begin to think of themselves as being self-sufficient. They think of themselves as having all the protection that they need because of their money that they possess. They believe that they have enough money that they can buy anything that their hearts desire. You see, these individuals trust their wealth more than they trust God. You see, they haven't learned the lesson of Jesus in Luke 12, 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. My friends, riches are wonderful, but they are not God. Riches are blessings, but they are not the fount of all blessings. Riches can provide power to an individual, but they are not the all-powerful God. My life is not centered upon my wealth. My life needs to be centered upon God. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up for themselves in store a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Folks, the Lessons in that text are unbelievable, are they not? Charge who? A specific group of individual. Not the poor. Not those who are wanting. Not those who are hurting. I want you to charge the rich. How would you have liked to have been a rich man in that congregation in those days? Wow, Paul's talking directly to me. You got that right. Sometimes preaching talks directly to a group of individuals, and that's okay. When individuals walk out and say, hey, preacher, you were preaching right to me. I say, I sure was. I got no problems with that. If the shoe fits, wear it. That's what they say. Charge them that are rich in this world. That they be what? That they be not high-minded. There you go. Proud. Arrogant. I'm smart. I'm great. I'm wonderful. Look at me. I've got all this wealth. He says, secondly, you charge them not to trust in those riches. My friends, riches can take wings, can they not? And fly away. If you don't believe it, just look at the stock market over the last two years. And a boatload of wealth lost, at least on paper, hasn't it? Almost one-fifth of individuals' wealth has, is gone in two years. How does that happen? You can't trust riches. They may not be here forever. But rather, where do we need to put our trust? He says, in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Folks, He's the possessor of wealth. This world belongs to Him. It's His, is it not? And the cattle on a thousand hills. That's the one we need to put our trust in. And we need to understand as well, if we are rich, what we need to be doing with our money, don't we? It's not to make me great. Oh, no. I need to use that wealth. I need to do good. I need to be involved in good works. I need to make certain that I distribute my wealth in order to assist and help other individuals. Because one of these days, I'll just leave it all behind, won't I? Go back and study Solomon. And Solomon will tell you that if you don't use your thing, your wealth wisely, that it's just vanity and vexation of spirit. Because you'll leave it all behind to people who don't really care about it. 
Individuals who didn't work for it. Individuals who may waste it in some shape, form, or fashion. My friends, the rich man's concern needs to be what? It needs to be eternal things, doesn't it? Lay up in store for him a good foundation against the time to come that he may lay hold on eternal life. A rich man can enter into heaven even when it's difficult. And it is difficult for the wealthy, isn't it? We turn to Matthew, the 19th chapter, and we see a rich man coming to Jesus, don't we? Beginning in verse 16. And I find it interesting that when he comes, he asks a question. Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Two things about that. Number one, it's a wonderful question, isn't it? There is no greater question. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Don't you wish everybody in the world would walk up to you and ask you that? Great question. And notice, secondly, he went to the right person, didn't he? If there's anybody who knows the answer to that question, it's the Son of the living God. If I were to see this man, even though he's wealthy, I would have said, wow! You are wise. You've asked the right question to the right person. Why callest thou me good? For there is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt have eternal life, keep the commandments. Well, our world needs a good dose of that, don't they? Jesus knew where life is. My friends, life is in keeping the law under which you live. This man lived under the law of Moses, didn't he? Where is life found? Jesus told him, life is found in keeping those commandments. The rich man knew that there were many commandments, so immediately he responds with a question, which, which one of the commandments are important? Which ones do I really need to keep? Go back and study the text in Jesus list 6. He ends with, love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man's response is interesting, isn't it? All these have I kept from my youth up. Sounds like a wise man to me, doesn't you? Here's a man who lived under the law. Jesus tells him, keep these commandments. Jesus And the young man says, I've kept every one of those. What a wise man. He should have kept his mouth shut. Because he opened his mouth, did he not? And he says this, What lack I yet? Don't ask that question. The Ten Commandments are divided into two sections, aren't they? Four commands that involve man's relationship with God. Six commands that involves man's relationship with things on the earth. When Jesus listed those six commands... Five of them came from the Ten Commandments. And all five of them came from the section involving man's relationship with men and the world. There was one Jesus didn't mention. And it was this one. Thou shalt not covet. Isn't that interesting? Of the six that pertain to man's relationship with the world, that's the one Jesus had omitted. And now when the man asks him, what like I yet? Jesus puts him to the test. Go, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Jesus doesn't mention the commandment, thou shalt not covet. He puts him to the test of covetousness, doesn't he? Do you love your wealth so much that you're going to hold on to it and reject me? Or will you give it all up and come and follow me? That's the test for this wealthy man. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. Because he had great possessions. Here was a man who shows himself now to be a fool, doesn't he? He looks so wise up to this point. Holding on to that wealth. 
and rejecting the Christ, he showed himself to be a wise fool. Point number three, I knew we'd run out of time. Point number three involves the sluggard. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 16. The Bible says that the sluggard is wise in his own conceits, more than seven men that can render a reason. The sluggard, the slothful, the indolent, the lazy. Here's an individual who needs to be out working and laboring and toiling. He has the knowledge, he has the ability, he can be out working, but he refuses to do so. And he has all kinds of excuses as to why he can't. It's too cold. There's a line in the street. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Proverbs 13 and verse 4, Proverbs 20 and verse 4, end with the same words. Folks, a sluggard will eventually ruin his own life. Both of those passages end with these words, and hath nothing. If you don't work, if you don't labor, if you don't toil, if you're not out diligently doing what needs to be done for your life, you will end with nothing. And sadly, our world is encouraging indolence. Our world is encouraging laziness, isn't it? A universal income? You don't do nothing and you get a check? Unbelievable. Work fewer hours, more benefits, retire earlier, less days at work. But what about in the church? Is there much to do? We sing that song, don't we? There is much to do. There is work on every hand. And yet, in every congregation of the Lord's people, about 20% do 80% of the work. Where are the 80%? What are they doing? Oh yes, they show up and they sit in a pew. Ooh, that takes a lot of effort. You've got to get up and get dressed. You've got to drive to the building. And you've got to sit there for an hour. Whew, you're just worn out after that. Now, friends, we need a good dose of Matthew 25, beginning of verse 24, and the one-talent man, don't we? There's two lessons about that one-talent man that I want to point out. Number one, a one-talent man will give an account. That Lord had distributed His goods to those three servants, Gave one man the one talent, and guess what? He had to give an account to his Lord, didn't he? If we're lazy, if we're indolent, if we refuse to work and labor and toil, we will give an account unto the Almighty God. The last lesson is found in verse 30. Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The lazy, the slothful, will be punished. Oh yes, individuals can find all kinds of excuses as to why they can't work in the church. I don't know enough. I don't have enough time. I got so many other things that I really need to be doing. There's others who are paid to do that. 10,000 excuses not to do something. My friends, the slothful are wise fools. Yes, they may get out of a lot of work, but one of these days they will give an account unto God. Last point. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs 28, verse 26. A man who trusts in his own heart is a wise fool. If you were to ask him, are you smart? Oh, yes. I'm a smart man. The Lord says, if you trust in your heart, you're a fool. We have some wise fools today that are atheists, don't we? And they'll boldly stand before us and they will proclaim, there is no God. And it doesn't matter how much evidence that there is. And my friends, God has given an abundance of it. And he says, I've given him so much that they are without excuse. 
And yet, they still make their proclamation, don't they? The fool is set in his heart. There is no God. And I don't care how many PhDs he has after his name. He's a fool. But then we have another group of individuals in the religious world today. And those individuals are wise fools as well because they trust in their own heart or they trust in the teachings of another man's heart. And in the book, I give three different illustrations of that. One in science, one in politics, and one in religion. Ooh, those are things you're not supposed to talk about. Isn't that right? Let me ask you something. If a man were to stand before us this morning and he says this, I am a scientist. Would you think he's wise? I would. I've been trained to think that, haven't you? He's studied science. He's researched. He's gone out in the world. He's done the experimentation. And now he's bringing all of those facts and all of the things that he's learned and he's going to present those things to me. And you can tell he's well educated by all the degrees that he has. Boy, there's a smart man. We're being told today that we as human beings can change the weather. Now, we're being told, being told a lot more than that, aren't we? We're being told that men can be women and women can be men. We're being told that you can't define what a woman is. And, and this is supposed to be science. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Now, again, quotes in the book where individuals say, we as human beings are the cause of climate change and we must be the ones who correct climate change. Who created this earth? God did. And Isaiah 45 verse 18 says this, He created it to be inhabited. When God put two people on the earth, do you not think He had the ability to look down the quarters of time to this day and see 8 billion people on earth? Sure He knew that. Do you realize that they were going to go out and they were going to learn things and develop things and have things that they never had before like SUVs? God knew that. Do you think God knew that they were going to be using fossil fuels and those fossil fuels are going to be emitting certain kind of gases into the air? God knew that. Folks, God created this earth to what? Be inhabited. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says this, He upholdeth all things by the word of His power. God's upholding this world. I'm not upholding this world. You're not upholding this world. God is holding the world in His hands. While the earth remains, there shall be seed time and harvest. And heat and cold, and winter and summer, and day and night. As long as the earth remains. Proverbs 8 verse 29 tells us that God has set a bound to the seas. Oh yes, occasionally when a storm comes along, the seas go over their bounds just a little bit, don't they? But they always return right back to where they were supposed to be. God set a bound on the seas, my friends. God's in control of the tides. Not mankind. And the Bible tells us that this earth is going to remain until God, not man, destroys it. 2 Timothy 3 verse 10. Point number two. The political world today. We have leaders of nations standing before us and saying, making a promise of something, and it's this. Let me rule, let me be in power, let me have the authority, and guess what? I will give you a utopia. 
And it's on both sides of the aisle. Isn't it? If we get this man in, it'll be a utopia. If we get this man in, it'll be a utopia. There will never be a utopia on earth. Never. Why? Because we live in a fallen earth, don't we? Who is the God of this world? It's Satan. Who is the prince of the power of the air? It's Satan. In order to bring about a utopia, we have to give individuals power, do we not? And guess what happens when men get power? They're usually corrupted by that power, are they not? And they use that power in wrong ways. Oh yes, they elevate themselves and they push others down and they make certain that they stay in control of all humanity. There's only one utopia and that's heaven. Isn't there? My friends, right now, the best place you can be in order to enter into that utopia is in the precious church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because you see, those who are in Christ have forsaken the world, have they not? We've died to the passions of this world. We're individuals who are seeking to be like Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We are putting the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And we realize that we are strangers and pilgrims here. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 2 verse 20. There's where your utopia is. The third point involves salvation and religion. Just accept the Lord Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved. Just make this admonition. I am a sinner. And Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for the salvation of my sins. He rose again the third day. And he sits now on the right hand of the throne of God. And I accept him now as my personal Savior. And you'll be saved. That is a wise fool who says that. It's not true. I love to go to Acts the second chapter. Peter and those 11 apostles are preaching the gospel for the first time, aren't they? And they have a huge crowd that's been amassed. And they cry out. Men and brethren, what shall we do if what the Calvinist and many in the denominational world say regarding the sinner's prayer is true? Peter should have just stopped and says, guys, here's all you need to do. Say the sinner's prayer. That's not what Peter said. And then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, verse 38. That, my friends, is what you need to do to be saved. And all Peter was doing is echoing the words of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who had given him a commission just a few days hence. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Peter was echoing the words of his precious Savior. And my friends, those are the words we need to echo today. Wise fools need to wise up, don't they? And if they don't, they will stand before God in the last day and they will be shown that their wisdom is nothing but foolishness. And whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Wise fools will have their houses to fall. Thank you. May be dismissed for about 10 minutes. Thank you, Brother Rock. I hated to stop him.